Um, hi. So, uh, you are listening to Imaginary Advice. My name is Ross Sutherland. This episode, I am turning over the podcast to a guest author, the writer Tim Harding. Um, I'm really excited to share Tim's story with you guys. Uh, just before we begin the episode, though, let me um, let me quickly do some housekeeping. I have uh, just recently, in this last week, I've added a, uh, a merch link on the Imaginary Advice website. So you can now buy official Imaginary Advice corporate logo t-shirts from imaginaryadvice.com. So that's, um, that's another way you can support the show if you want to. I mean, imagine the scene. You arriving at the pub to meet someone. You, know, you, you come in, pop off your jumper, revealing beneath a black or grey t-shirt featuring the corporate logo of an obscure audio fiction podcast. Immediately, right, the person opposite you is going to be like, whoa, Greg. Your name's, your name's Greg, by the way. Whoa, Greg. What's, what, what's imaginary advice? Is that some cool German techno label or something? And, um... You don't need to say anything. You know, you just slide into the booth opposite them quietly. And then you, 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 you grab them by the throat and you say, none of your fucking business, Dad. None of your fucking business. You walk out on us 20 years ago. Now you call me up. You tell me to meet you here. You just expect me to go along with... Fuck you. Now you can talk about my t-shirt. Fuck you. Anyway, anyway, imagine that scene. That could be you. It could be you. If you don't want a t-shirt, that's fine, but you still want to support the show? Okay, well, the best way to do that is to join uh, my Patreon. So that basically means giving a small monthly donation that helps me keep the lights on. This show, it's got no adverts. It is 100% funded through listener donations. So if you're interested in that, there's a bonus podcast I do once a month which is a, a long conversation with a special guest about an old Imagine Advice episode where we talk about the development process and about creativity in general. Uh, uh, yeah, so if you're interested in that or supporting the show in general, go to www.patreon.com forward slash Ross G Sutherland. Alternatively... If none of that works for you, you can make a one-off donation to the show through buymeacoffee.com forward slash imaginary advice. Okay, that's it. Admin over. Now I'm going to hand over to Tim Harding. Here we go. Left with no other way to amuse ourselves, my wife and I use our telescope to gaze across the marsh into the window of the woman who's run the bike rental ever since she moved back here seven years ago to be closer to her mother. We like to watch her screensaver, which draws from her My Photos folder to display a slideshow of pictures in which she poses with people we've never seen. I keep an eye out for landmarks in the background of the photos and describe them for my wife so that she can write them in the search engine. Large brown building with columns, I might say, and she might scold me for lacking specifics, but the fact of the matter is that I never learned to type, so the labour can only be divided in this way. Try large brown building with columns hot country, I might say, if her slutty bare arms are anything to go by. If we discover the name of the building, we mention it to others in the village. Tell Marigold at the bike shop to tell you about her trip to the Royal Crescent in Bath, we might say. The aim is to unsettle and frighten her, and we don't care if it comes back to us. That's just our way. We are forced to pass the time in this way during the long stretches between guests when our B&B is empty. We find it difficult to attract guests for large parts of the year. Not all the guests leave reviews, but if someone does leave a review, it will always condemn my wife and I and our practices in the strongest possible terms. 
Every time this happens, we use an alt account to report our BNB to TripAdvisor as being permanently closed and then rename the BNB and change the photos. We can't take photos of the house because it's an utter ruin in most respects and our interior design choices are very specifically tailored to our needs. So we take our photos from other BNBs with high ratings and usually no one notices. Currently, we go by the name Cottage on Owl Meadow, which is one of my wife's. I would never use a bird name for the BNB because of its associations to the prince. But my wife says it isn't an issue because the prince doesn't appear on searches. Besides all this, the area is not pleasant. Barren and boggy with many biting flies. The flies cluster around obese brown boars that wander sluggishly through the mud and drink their blood through seven-inch proboscises to penetrate the thick hair and hide. The boars have only one significant predator, and if it finds them, there's nothing they can do but die. So there is no need to develop speed or agility or even the behaviour of caution. All they can do is multiply enough and grow so enormous that when the prince comes to the bog, it will get full up before the entire species is turned into a pile of brown bones. Meanwhile, the flies fill themselves with treacly boar blood. You can shine a torch through a cloud of them and see the cloud glow red. It means on most nights, the air is filled with bags of blood like snowflakes in a blizzard, and we think that's why the prince comes here. We call it the prince because we've been told it responds to fealty. But the only way to find out about it was to ask our parents, who were so stupid and just lied about it for their entire lives until they died at the prince's hand. Really, it's a flock of carnivorous starlings of some kind. We don't like to pry as we feel it's rude to try and find out too much about it and could invite reprisals. The effect is similar to a swarm of locusts, but the prince has Catholic tastes, as my mother would say. I that me to strip the flesh from your bones as the moss from the stones. In actual fact, everything left outside gets peeled, and we can just leave it at that. It is thought we should do what the prince does, so we try to be uncaring and cruel. That's why we persecute Marigold, who works at the bike shop. We mean no harm by it, or you might say that we mean only harm. It's not personal, at least. Although the attacks can sometimes become very personal. We try and get people to come to the BNB because it brings a little money in, and we think it's good to be cruel and threatening to people who visit the area for pleasure. The good thing about being cruel and sowing confusion is that you can do it in so many different ways. But we still find ourselves falling into old habits. Guests are usually disgusted and afraid when they arrive at the house and see the state of it. The stucco has all been pecked away. The paint is long gone. The French shutters were a nice touch once, but we've nailed them shut to stop the prince from looking inside and seeing that there are living things within. The whole building looks ravished and blurred, and the garden is a wasteland. The shell of my wife's Skoda has sat in the driveway since the prince stripped the tyres, ate the paint, and rusted the metal with its acidic droppings. Perhaps most basically, we try to be unavailable when they want to find us, and always about when they wish to be alone. It's a simple matter of withholding keys for the bedroom doors, and either hiding from people or bursting in on them at the worst moment. Through to Bullish Prize Board, Bob and Tony with £325, which means you've got to say cheerio. At night, I leave the television on in an empty room with the noise turned all the way up. If we have a lady to stay, I like to go through her belongings and gnaw through the gusset of her underwear like a rat. They're always so sad when they first arrive. But we're a long way from anywhere, and there's nowhere else to stay, so they have to spend one night at least, unless they decide to sleep in their car or just drive off into the night, which does sometimes happen. We often hear one of them crying while the other tells them it will look better in the light of day. In the morning, we give them a horrible breakfast, apologise for everything they've experienced so far, 
and offer them a discount if they elect to continue their stay with us. We have a voucher that we give them for dinner at a restaurant that doesn't exist. So they drive around in the bog for a while searching for it and return hungry. We express regret. Previous generations tried to deter the prince through penitence or aggression, and none of them made it in one piece to the safety of their graves. This dog's delight to bark and bite, my mother used to say. And for the past 20 years, we've been trying to show the prince that we share in this delight. Marigold at the bike shop, who we persecute when the B&B is vacant, is party to many of our crimes. She watches us with a telescope of her own, and when she sees a light in the window of the guest room, she rides her little bike through the marsh and waits in the garden like a scarecrow until we let her in and tell her how she can help. Sometimes we get her to scream in the night or follow the guests around for days on end, begging for money or food or some indefinable mercy until the guests start begging too to be left alone and then they're just a handful of people desperately begging at each other in a dark bog while the prince begins to murmurate in the evening sky. As long-term residents of the area, we can observe a pattern of attacks that shape our behaviour. The attacks usually come at random times, in sustained bursts of no particular length. Our parents said we should stay inside when it happens, and we do try and make an effort, but there is no such thing as a cardo or broadband here, so eventually our hunger and boredom gets the better of us, along with the oppressive knowledge that we've just about survived every previous visitation, so why would this be any different? So we sneak out more and more, and life returns to normal, while the prince shows no sign of abating. But then it starts again, and we head down to the basement, sleep in a wire cage again, realising with a fatalistic chuckle that what we have mistaken for an unrelenting period of attack is actually a lull between periods of attack, pending a mighty escalation in fury. My wife accepts a booking from a group of ornithologists, two men and a woman. She doesn't mean to, she just accepts every booking without looking at it. We only realise they're interested in birds when they turn up in a van with a bird-identifying computer inside. They seem interested in our mangled house, but not afeared. I help them carry their steel cases up to the bedroom, and later, when it gets dark, prop a ladder against their van and cover the roof with mice entrails in order to attract the prince. But in the morning, the van is still intact, and the entrails fly onto the gravel as the ornithologists accelerate down the hill. We pass all the day in watchfulness, my wife and I. The hope is that darkness will fall, and the bird watchers will not return, and that subsequently, they'll never return and we can sell the clothes they leave behind at the car boot sale, as we sometimes do. The sun sets at 2.30, and we're relieved. In their luggage, we find small, sweet, crunchy cakes in bright wrappers, and that night we feast upon them by candlelight at the oak dining table that is our only heirloom. We eat and eat until my head is pounding and my teeth are glued together. And then the ornithologists come back and startle us in the act. We barricade the dining room, but they must have seen the huge pile of foil and noticed their food missing from their luggage. Our only saving grace as regards this humiliation is that we don't care, but we are both deflated by the group's survival. If the prince didn't get them, where were the boars? If the boars didn't get them, where were the biting flies? It makes no sense. We try to think of a plan, but fall unconscious as soon as the last cake is consumed and wake before dawn feeling wretched and dying of thirst. The ornithologists have already left for the day. We set off for the village to tell people what's been happening. When we reach the outskirts, Marigold struggles through the hedgerow and wants to know who owns the van that she's seen outside the B&B. This peeping will be the end of her. We ignore her and continue on our way while she leaps around us and makes her demands. She craves the prestige of having some secret knowledge which she can dole out and withhold on the high street, but this knowledge will not come from us. 
we go first to Chip Bar, where my wife holds the door closed to Marigold while I tell the chipmen about our visitors. The aim is to distribute the information to as many people as possible throughout the village so that everyone is aware of the ornithologists and can hinder them if the opportunity arises. Chip Bar is a good place to start, as many villagers will pass through its door in the next few days looking for a chip meal, and thus word will spread. We do the same at the betting shop and the brown jug, and then we're out the other side of the village, barging into the garage. The garage is full of people doing their weekly shop. We've come at a good time. My wife seizes the tannoy and begins to bellow. Even Marigold out on the forecourt can hear, but we don't mind. We've made it common knowledge now that there are ornithologists here who will harm the prince by attempting to understand it. The villagers pretend not to have heard us. They stand still in the aisles and avoid looking at my wife, and after she's finished speaking, they carry on as though nothing has been said. We don't expect them to acknowledge the issue explicitly. It's enough that they're aware and will find their own ways to honour and protect the prince. We walk back through the village and make it to the war memorial before my wife grabs my elbow and we stop dead. She can hear a sound like wind blowing across the canopy of an ancient forest, but there are no trees in the village. The noise is the sound of biting flies in the hundreds of thousands, flying over our heads in a great rushing river of tiny souls. They're fleeing the prince, which crests the hill a moment later and descends on the village. I shit. Maybe my wife does too, but you can't let it slow you down. The brown jug is near us and I can see the parcels flipping across the room as they make for the door. I make it there in three seconds, them in two. My hope is that I can hit the door without slowing down, get them before they're fully braced. My hope is unfounded. I slam into the door and my wife slams into me. The jug's heavy wood bends both times and I hear the men on the other side grunt, but we're still outside. My wife screams and beats the wood, but we have no time. Behind us is breaking glass and the sound of a circular saw. As the prince enters Mrs. Flannery's house and reduces the contents to fine threads. She had recently been leaving her windows unboarded during the day, which is an invitation to the prince, one of many. I drag my wife into the alley besides the pub and we lie flat in the dirt under a sheet of corrugated plastic with our eyes shut tight and our fingers in our ears. The prince ignores us in its wisdom. We think it went into Mrs. Flannery's because the windows were unboarded, but we're not sure why it also destroyed the Lily's house at the end of the terrace. Perhaps they were using aromatic ingredients in their cooking. My wife and I returned to the B&B, having tried our best and survived another day. She curses the dogs, and those she describes as less than dogs, who barred the tavern door when we most needed it opened. I soothe her by making up good news. I tell her the ornithologists will be leaving soon as we've eaten all their foil cakes. They won't survive for long without food. I tell her the prince's actions today indicate its favour towards us, although neither of us knows what the prince's favour might mean or how it could make our lives more tolerable. I remind myself of a biting fly. We both hate it when I make these pacifications. My wife wants to throw a knitting needle through my throat and pin me to the wall next to the other damp stains. No sin too small to be pinned to the wall, as my mother used to say. The ornithologists return groaning from a feast. They unzip their fleeces to give room to their bellies. Who allowed this to happen? No one that we know would have served them. They tell us a famous restaurant is nearby and that we must feel very lucky living so close to a world-renowned restaurant like that. We do not know of such a thing. They go to bed. It's too much. 
My wife makes for the stairs with an axe in her claw. An axe I've never seen before. Not the one she makes me use to split wood, which is dull with a tiny handle. She means to chop heads in the guest room. What's wrong with the world today? Everyone's acting crazy. I catch her halfway up the staircase, grab her ankles and yank. She tips forward and breaks her nose on the landing, which was not my intention. She squirms around and takes a swing, and the swing takes off my double crown like a hairy little piece of salami. The flesh disc lands on the carpet, and blood starts to fountain down my head. The axe is lodged in the wall, where it has bisected a portrait miniature of my mother. Her meagre bust and pearls fall off her neck in half a frame and bounce down the stairs. I drag my wife into the kitchen with some difficulty and cuff her to the boiler. Let me! She screams. Would you take the prince's food from his table? I scream back. I wish the prince's wants and requirements were recorded somewhere or just discussed more openly. Leaving the edicts open to interpretation helps no one. We do not write of what comes in the night, my mother used to say. I don't even know for sure that she was talking about the prince, which does not come exclusively in the night. There is a fog of silence over the subject. We don't talk about it for years on end, and then we scream like gibbons when it comes over the hill. I've cuffed my wife to the cold water pipe and stuffed her loud mouth with an oven mitt. She's starting to quiet down until she hears a thud on the boarded window, at which point she falls instantly silent. We're trained from an early age to be quiet and respectful when danger is near, but a single concussive impact is unlikely to be the prince. Nevertheless, the observation hole I've drilled in the French shutters is dribbling blood into the kitchen like a bullet wound. We don't know what to think. I squeeze my wife's hot skull and nod at her rapidly to make sure we're both on the same page and should be very, very quiet. My teeth hurt from clenching and my eyes hurt from being so open. In the hallway, I find the letterbox drooling too. The substance is boar blood, I discover, with its toxic odour, an unmistakable and evocative nasal memory from my youth. I lift the flap for another familiar sight, the field full of latherers. That's what they call themselves, latherers, in masks of layered bracken. I have a mask like that, in a box with a dirty bucket. We fill the buckets with boar blood and slosh it on the doors and windows of the houses we wish the prince would enter. It's a good way to shred a building and everything in it without going to much trouble. And it brings the community together. I'm still holding the letterbox open when the next bucket hits. The reflective panels on marigold cycling shorts are clearly visible for a second before the flap spews boar blood all over my face and neck. I feel sorry for poor Marigold, who never understood why we hurt her, sitting there every night in the crosshairs of our telescope, wondering how a community could be so cruel to a poor woman with a pathetic dream of maintaining her dead mother's bike rental shop. If she had known anything about the prince, she would have known that nothing she could have done would have made us treat her humanely. Take us all to Athens with your inheritance money, Marigold. We would have pushed you down the stairs of large brown building with columns hot country and left you to the privations of a foreign hospital. The latherers mount their fleet of hired bicycles and roll down the hill to enjoy each other's company. Ah, how I wish that were me. Masks of bracken come in handy for more than one reason. It's good to feel a sense of ceremony when you're daubing and it can also be good to hide your face when you're destroying the homes of others. Most of all, we wear them so that lathering decisions can be made without prejudice. Something happens when David from the brown jug puts on a bracken mask, or I, or any other. We can pretend it's the bracken speaking, not the man. His ideas of who to daub and who to destroy seem like they might be sensible instead of worthless, and we forget the time that the man under the bracken once went behind the counter at Chip Bar and intentionally put his foot in the fryer. That's why on some level I can't resent them too much for their decision to feed us to the prince. 
we gave them the necessary information when we went to the garage and after that, it was out of our hands. The mob is always right. I trudge up to the guest suite and open the door a crack. It's too dark to see much, but I can make out lumps under duvets lowly buzzing with breath. I close the door very quietly and turn the key in the lock. It almost feels worth it. Downstairs in the kitchen, I wash the boar blood off myself and tell my wife we've been marked as I uncuff her. She doesn't suggest cleaning the blood off the portals. Not all stinks can be washed away, not in the time we have left. Instead, she sprays me with surface cleanser in an attempt to neutralise my personal scent marker, then busies herself in collecting the precious things we can carry away and save from the prince while I sit on the doorstep and listen out for wing beats. She doesn't mention my cuffing her to the radiator, and I don't mention the missing part of my head, even though it's interacting very intensely with the surface cleanser. Such outdated animosities are forgotten now. The night is still and silent. The only sound is my wife clattering around the house. Perhaps this sluggish air will keep the blood scent from spreading. But no, vain hope. A persistent sigh is rising from the woods. I call for my wife. Time to leave, time to get the fuck away from here. She runs down the stairs, wringing the neck of an empty sack. Couldn't think of anything she wanted to say with her, God bless her. And God bless us both, for that matter. May we be protected. May we be kept while others are discarded. From a safe distance, flat on our stomachs in the mud, we watch as our house is destroyed. The prince moves in and out of the building through the windows, door and chimney like a needle and thread, but one that unsews. A great amount of dust is emitted and our home gently crumbles, losing its final source of sustaining energy as the prince departs, scything across the field in the direction of the marsh. One lagging constituent, possibly concussed, follows the swarm with a series of sloppy flaps. We gather ourselves, having nothing else to our name, and slap off down the B road on tired souls. Never before have I lost everything I own. The most surprising aspect of the experience is that it brings no relief. Rather, I feel more than ever that I have too much to carry, one heavy scuffed flesh to drag along the ground whether I like it or not. To clarify, I'm not referring to my wife who has ever been a comfort. After dawn and still on the road, a van pulls alongside us and slides open its side door. Ornithologists, or people who look very much like them. They seem not to recognize us. Have we changed that much? There are no reflective surfaces in which to check my appearance. The ornithologists haven't changed at all, not even from alive to dead, which was the minimum I had expected when I locked the guest room door and fled the house. The bird identifying computer is coming to life in the van's interior, and they invite us inside to sit on stools where they lower headphones over our ears and set microphones in front of us. Just for a couple of man on the street, talking heads kind of thing, they say. Just watch this, say whatever comes to mind, clearly into the microphone, keep it natural. Have you ever heard of the phrase warm regional before? Never mind. Just clearly and into the microphone. We sit and wait while one of them opens a file on the desktop and goes to full screen. They show us footage of a darkening sky above a familiar black bog. A thousand million starlings take to the air and murmurate a vast shape with no sides or boundaries. The ornithologists watch our faces patiently, waiting for a reaction. So, Lessons in Fealty was written and performed by Tim Harding. 
The sound design was by me, Ross Sutherland. Additional thanks to Charlie Perkins. The story also contained original music by Jeremy Wormsley. Uh, for more of Jeremy's music, go to jeremywormsley.com. Tim is currently working on a collection of short stories. Um, he's also working on his debut novel about a war between an indoor swimming pool and an outdoor swimming pool. If you want to keep up with Tim Harding, he's on both Twitter and Instagram as at Hot Fingers Club. That's all for this time. My name is Ross Sutherland. Uh, I'll be back soon with more imaginary advice. <laughs>